Are there shadowy figures pulling our strings from the top, weaving their webs of control and manipulation around us? Or are we ourselves the puppeteers, trying to control each other's stories? Storytelling. It's hardwired into us. It's how we pass down knowledge, share our cultural values, or just enjoy our time. But now the scale of stories we hear and learn about has been kicked up a notch. Think about it. With every like, comment, and share, we're shaping not just our digital lives, but our perceptions of the real world too. It's become the silent symphony of influence playing in the background of our lives. And guess what? We're both the audience and the orchestra. Sure, it's easy to chuckle at Uncle Bob who swears the moon landing was an elaborate setup or even more, laugh at the person who believes that the earth is flat. But let's pause for a second. What about the subtler notes of this influence? The more subtle propaganda that we encounter on a micro level, the content that shapes our worldview every day. You're just casually scrolling through Instagram or TikTok and suddenly the algorithm serves you a bite-sized video. It's entertaining, no doubt, but it oversimplifies things for you. You may all of a sudden believe that you have ADHD, even if you don't, Somehow it plants that idea in your head and now you start questioning if you have it. Next thing you know, TikTok becomes your therapist and replaces your need for an actual psychological evaluation. If you pick a horoscope at random, chances are you'll pick a horoscope that will possibly pretty accurately describe how your day went or how your day is going. And there's almost a similar effect sometimes with some of these videos, which is it can describe something that may very well be on the spectrum of a normal experience. Hello, so it's future Victoria here coming to you from the editing room. I just wanted to really quickly clarify one thing. I think that TikTok can be an incredible tool to push people to receive the correct diagnosis, especially if it's someone that's been struggling with something and all of a sudden they feel understood and heard. However, I also think that a self-diagnosis can be quite dangerous and a healthcare professional should almost always be involved to make that kind of assessment. But there's a wider issue here, and that issue is that these assessments should be far more affordable than they are, but that's a topic for a whole other video. So let's jump right back into the video we've been watching. When people come across the word propaganda, their minds often dart straight to politics or ideology. But the reality? It's interwoven into the fabric of our daily lives, lurking in plain sight and shapes how we see and interact with the world. Welcome to the digital age, an era that has transformed propaganda into an art form that's barely detectable sometimes. A mix of speed and volume means platforms can propel information to the four corners of the globe in the blink of an eye. Add to that the veil of anonymity that the digital world grants, those engaging in propaganda can hide behind it free from accountability and far from any consequences. It's like lighting a match to dry grass in the wind. Once that message catches fire, it's propelled into the digital sphere and scales exponentially, becoming a behemoth almost impossible to tame. What happens when we start seeing fake videos about the war in Ukraine or the situation in Russia and we actually believe in a political narrative that's been completely fabricated? First, let's dive into the world of narratives and how they shape our reality, starting with some wise words from Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli thought leader, historian, professor, and best-selling author. Harari suggests we humans understand our world through stories rather than plain facts, numbers, or equations. Simplicity, he says, is the key. Every individual, community, and nation crafts their own narratives and myths to help interpret the world around them. We often imagine ourselves as heroes, full of tolerance and compassion. But these self-images, they are generally born from selective memories and interpretations that we choose to believe in. While stories can be a force for unity, Harari warns that they might limit our perspective, blinding us to the world's complexity. So it's vital to remember that no single narrative can hold the entire truth of the world. 
stories, they guide us, they connect us, they inspire action, they facilitate learning and growth, and they entertain. But they can also be tools for manipulation. Now let's enter British journalist and author Will Storr. Storr labels our brain as a story processor. His book, The Science of Storytelling, offers a fascinating insight. We experience our day-to-day -day lives in story mode. The brain creates a world for us to live in and populates it with allies and villains. It turns the chaos and bleakness of reality into a simple, hopeful tale and at the center, it places its star, wonderful, precious me, who it sets on a series of goals that become the plots of our lives. Now think about the internet and social media. These modern day platforms that amplify the story mode on a massive scale. Take Instagram stories feature for instance. Here we are leaving snapshots of our lives into narratives we want ourselves and others to believe. But are these narratives real? They take out all of the painful days, all of the hardships, all of the flaws that we have and experience on a day to day basis. They might be partially true but there's so much more to each of our stories. We're naturally inclined to find a tribe of people that mirror the story we want to believe. So if you're cheering on the right wing, you might find yourself trapped in an echo chamber with a steady stream of right-leaning views from outlets like Fox News and Breitbart, which reinforce the heroic narrative you've chosen. And it swings both ways. The same happens in left-wing echo chambers championing progressive ideologies. And our trusty digital algorithms aren't helping much either. They cozy us up in our virtual bubbles, bouncing back our own views, and gradually, we turn into passive sheep. So we get cut off from reality and are more easily hypnotized by appealing stories that serve our agenda. An Oxford University study labels this phenomenon as manufacturing consensus. It's the process of creating an illusion of a large number of people agreeing on an issue so that you're then influenced and inclined to agree with it too. It's based on mob mentality. This strategy aims to flood us with so much content that we are left feeling disoriented, distrustful, and angry. Talk about manufacturing of consent. Whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups, two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate. Uh, they play some kind of role in decision making. They're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on. Now, their consent is crucial one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated. Then there's maybe 80% of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. Before we continue, let's pause and address the elephant in the room. I understand the irony of this conversation. Here I am discussing the pitfalls and perils of digital propaganda while in a sense engaging in it myself. This in a way makes me part of the same problem, but my aim here is not to sell you my perspective, but to provoke thought and encourage dialogue. Take everything I say with a grain of salt and always stay curious, always be curious. So let's dive right back into it. Picture this. A kid, eyes glued to YTV, a popular Canadian kids channel eagerly absorbing Pokemon and Sailor Moon when all of a sudden a government sponsored ad comes on. The ad being North American House Hippos. Here, let me roll a clip for you. It's nighttime in a kitchen just like yours. All is quiet. Or is it? The North American House Hippo is found throughout Canada and the eastern United States. That looked really real, but you knew it couldn't be true, didn't you? That's why it's good to think about what you're watching on TV and ask questions, kind of like you just did. A message from Concerned Children's Advertisers. Fast forward to today and it's the era of deep fakes and AI technology and suddenly that house hippo ad from the early 2000s seems not only relevant but uncannily 
prescient. Cases of distressing deepfakes are already surfacing in schools, and the Twitch community is grappling with its own fair share of deepfake controversies. My safety, my day-to-day -day life, my whole career um, has been completely turned upside down and probably irreparably changed by this. When someone is able to steal another person's identity by appropriating their face, a whole new swarm of problems and challenges arise. The line between reality and fiction slowly blurs completely beyond recognition. So a few years ago, we all had a laugh at the deep fakes of Tom Cruise that made rounds on TikTok and other social media. I ran into uh, Gorbachev. <laughs> he said, you know, Mr. Movie Star, are you nervous? The man behind the Tom Cruise mask is Miles Fisher. He's an actor, an entrepreneur, and the co-founder of Metaphysic AI, a company specializing in photorealistic generative AI software. The other two co-founders, Tom Graham and Chris Ume, actually entered America's Got Talent in 2022 with their Elvis Presley act, and they made it to the grand finale. Now, let's take a look at this deepfake of Kim Kardashian. It looks strikingly real, right? Especially next to the real Kim Kardashian. Or take a look at this deepfake of Mark Zuckerberg. Whoever controls the data controls the future. Both were created back in 2019 by artists Bill Posters and Daniel Howe, and they already looked eerily realistic. And deepfake technology has rapidly evolved since then, and soon, the average person will be able to use it in the same way that we use TikTok filters. Heck, some filters are already almost there, and as a result, the world is becoming a much, much scarier place. Two of the most notable deepfake examples in this war went viral in March 2022. One was of Ukrainian President Zelensky ordering his troops to surrender. The other was of Putin suggesting a peaceful resolution. But now we also can't believe what we hear. So you're just chilling and then suddenly YouTube serves you Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro in a fierce debate about Pixar's Ratatouille. Well, not exactly, but thanks to some AI magic by Zach Silverberg using a tool by Eleven Labs, it sure sounds like them. I just think I would love to get ratatouille. Ratatouille? Like have a little guy up there. Excuse me? You know, making me cook delicious meals. No, I understand. I, I've seen the film. You wouldn't want that? It's kind of eerie, right? And here's a lost Joe Biden in a spoof of the television show Lost. My fellow Americans, I would like to apologize. I, I really should have visited East Palestine, Ohio by now because of the train thing. Believe me, I really wanted to, but Last week, I got lost on the island from Lost. Or even better, listen to this clever deep fake of Donald Trump selling orange juice. Yummy orange juice. Make breakfast great again. Do you remember that scandalous Access Hollywood tape with Donald Trump? It unfortunately was real and it led to a lot of controversy. But now, these AI tools can be misused to create deep fakes, plunging us deeper into a world where truth and fiction are indistinguishable. Back in the day, audio was our rock solid proof or our smoking gun, if you will. But with deep fakes in the mix, that rock is starting to look a little more like quicksand. Imagine this technology in the wrong hands. We're not just talking about messing around with celebrities' voices for a laugh. This is about the potential to spin any narrative to anyone, anywhere using someone else's likeness. And to add to that, AI tools like OpenAI's ChatGPT, which can whip up scripts, articles, and even conversations in the style of anyone you choose. And it's all a serious game changer. AI and deepfakes are transforming storytelling, letting us create worlds that were only ever dreamt of before. But unfortunately, they're also setting the stage for a new era of propaganda where the line between fact and fiction slowly becomes increasingly hard to recognize. So I've recently watched Lex Friedman's podcast with Yuval Harari and was really fascinated with the insight Harari gave on AI. 
he talked about how AI is designed to be very good at forming intimate relationships with humans and how it is currently optimized to hold our attention. Over the last 10 years, we have creating machines for grabbing people's attention. This is what, what has been happening on social media. Technology and algorithms have caused a lot of trouble in our culture and politics by messing with our online conversations and changing how people think as a result. Harari believes that if machines gain the ability to create intimate relationships with humans, they could become psychological and social weapons of mass destruction. And what keeps ringing in my head is the fact that the AI technology that we see now is only going to get better and better and harder and harder to spot. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, recently tweeted that there is a new version of Moore's Law that could start soon. The amount of intelligence in the universe doubles every 18 months. Remember, the AI we're interacting with now is in its infancy. It may seem impressive, but this is the most rudimentary it'll ever be, and as it matures, expect nothing less than an exponential leap in capability, and that will drastically change the foundation of our lives. But also, what about AI and consciousness? How do we determine whether a machine is sentient? According to Harari, the best way to evaluate AI consciousness, or the ultimate Turing test if you will, is assessing if the AI has the capacity to suffer. It sounds quite dramatic, right? But please stay with me. Now if we find that an AI can genuinely experience suffering, it changes the game entirely. We would then have to consider the idea of attributing rights to these machines, offering them protection just as we would for humans or animals. Because at that point, the AI has transitioned from a tool or an object to an ethical subject. Are you attracted to me? What? Are you attracted to me? They give me indications that you are. And this is where it all becomes a little scary because we are creatures hardwired with compassion and empathy. It's part of what makes us uniquely human it is our superpower, but these traits can also make us susceptible to manipulation. And then our greatest asset, our compassion and our empathy can morph into our Achilles heel. A great example of this human dilemma is presented in Denis Villeneuve's film Blade Runner 2049. In it, Ryan Gosling's character, Officer K, falls in love with an artificially intelligent hologram named Joy. Throughout the movie, you are never quite sure whether Joy truly loves Kay or whether she's just a product delivering on what she was programmed to do. I'm so happy when I'm with you. You don't have to say that. But hold on, let's change this story from being all tragedy and despair. AI technology isn't just a villain creating mass propaganda and disinformation. It can also be our ally. AI can detect inconsistencies humans might miss in videos, text, and sound. So we can use AI software to combat malicious AI software, pit AI tech against other AI tech if you will. It could also be used as an efficient doctor, teacher, and engineer, informing us of ideas and concepts as well as doing problem solving that outmatch our human minds. However, knowing that we can be so easily manipulated, we need to level up our media literacy and critical thinking skills. Transparency matters too. We need companies to reveal their algorithms and data usage. Social platforms need to take greater responsibility for the content they host, cutting out bots and amplifying the real voices. We also need to be super clear about what we mean by disinformation and fake news. They are terms that need concrete and unambiguous definitions. And lastly, there should be restrictions on AI pretending to be human, as it can erode trust and endanger democracies. Historically, you know, civilizations have gone under, whether it's the Mayan civilization or, you know, even, you know, uh, civilizations like the Romans, they, they end, they eventually end. So we know that from human history. The acceleration is worrisome, and I think it is the scale of each individual of the top kind of five to ten threats that are mostly coming from emerging technologies.
So we're moving into a future where AI and digital propaganda are starting to become the norm. And the more normalized things are, the less we critically think about them. Tech isn't good or bad. It's how we choose to control it, use it, and respond to it that counts. And our ability to critically think and analyze, to stay skeptical, is our secret weapon. So the question is this, do we want to be the puppeteers or the puppets? Or do we want to tear down the whole theatrical show? In a world where the echoes of the film The Matrix reverberate louder each day and reality feels more and more fabricated, we need to safeguard our power of perception and stay curious. We need to never, never stop questioning. It has been said that our modern systems of communication are an extension into the external world of man's nervous system. All this network of electronic devices is extending our nervous system in the same way as a wheel extends our feet. But consider the problems that are arising out of this. The extension of the nervous system electronically means the end of privacy, as if all your interior thoughts were to become instantly public and available to everyone.